Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Oliver Schultz, and I am Curatorial Director at Pace Gallery in New York. It's my distinct privilege to be moderating today's panel discussion on the topic of Klaus Oldenburg and Kosha van Bruggen's artistic collaboration. The impetus for today's discussion is the exhibition Klaus and Kosha, a duet, a major show which is presently on view here at Pace Gallery in New York through May 9th. And I very much hope that those of you who can will come and see it. Before delving into the topic of today's panel though, I want to just take a moment on behalf of the gallery to express solidarity with those who are in protest and in mourning today, and with all those experiencing heartbreak, frustration, and rage at the killing of Dante Wright. Black Lives Matter, and all of us have a duty to speak up against the pernicious and pervasive injustices of systemic racism and state violence. So while today's topic might seem far afield from current events, I think in fact Oldenburg and Van Bruggen were always keenly concerned with the social conditions in which public art is embedded. And this is something we might touch on further with our distinguished group of panelists whom we're very fortunate to have in conversation today. But before I introduce them, please allow me to just say a few words about the exhibition and about Kloss and Kosha's relationship. On this spring afternoon in New York City, flowers are blooming both inside and outside the gallery. Uh, indeed, the occasion for the show is the debut of Dropped Bouquet, which you're seeing here, which is the final collaborative work that Klaus and Kosha conceived before Kosha's death in 2009, and which has been realized at monumental scale for the first time. Klaus has spent the better part of the past decade refining the original idea for the work. And it's really an honor to be able to present it as the centerpiece of the exhibition. I should say that much gratitude in that effort is owed to Marcia Oldenburg, whose dedication to her parents' work has really been instrumental in helping realize Klaus and Kosha's original vision at last. Drop Bouquet, I think it's fair to say, is the culmination of a long history of the legendary large-scale projects the more than 40 monumental sculptures that Oldenburg and Van Bruggen produced between the late 1970s and Van Bruggen's death in 2009. Uh, their collaboration has its roots all the way back in the early 70s when Kosha was working as a young curator at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. Klaus was by then already a famous American artist. And after meeting in Europe, they began an intense intellectual and artistic exchange, often by means of letters that culminated in their marriage in 1977. And from that point onward, Kosha was really Klaus's collaborator in all of the large scale works, each of which I think reflects different aspects of their exchange. But it wasn't until the 1980s um, when they made works like Spoonbridge and Cherry for the Walker Art Center and did their performance project Il Corso del Coltello, The Course of the Knife in Venice in 85, that Kosha became, I think, a lot more comfortable foregrounding her own role in the collaboration and when they began to jointly author um, works and attribute them to that collective uh, production. What our exhibition tries to do is look at this history in a fresh light um, to better understand Kosha's role in their collaboration when she's both, you know, working on, say, Documenta 7, but also collaborating with Klaus to make a work like Pickaxe, which is still installed in Kassel, and how she therefore, I think, really did embody the idea of a curator as artist way ahead of its time. Till the end, I think, in fact, <laughs> she remained Klaus's collaborator and an art historian and writer at the same time. And she was an art historian who specialized in a sense in the subject of Oldenburg. Um, she never abandoned her curatorial and critical practice even as she became an artist, full-fledged artist and evolved that sort of hybrid identity for herself into one that was really coterminous with this collective collaborative practice. The large scale sculptures that she and Klaus made over the course of four decades have become the best, some of the best known, some of the most beloved, and occasionally some of the most controversial large scale public art of the past 50 years. So 
But with that said, I'm so pleased and honored to be able to bring together this incredible group of three panelists today to speak to you about Klaus and Kosha's work, its legacy, how we think about it today um, from very different perspectives. So joining us from Minnesota is Mary Sarudi, Executive Director of the Walker Arts Center in Minneapolis. Before joining the, the Walker in January 2019, she served for 19 years as the executive director and chief curator of Sculpture Center right here in New York City. During her amazing tenure there, Mary spearheaded two major building projects while organizing dozens of solo and group exhibitions, special projects and commissions by more than 50 emerging and established artists who are of course too numerous to name, but who've gone on to be some of the most important figures in contemporary art. During this time, she helped establish the Long Island City Cultural Alliance and was formerly on the board of directors of the Long Island City Partnership and has served on numerous cultural advisory boards, including the Sunnyside Yard Steering Committee, the Park Avenue Sculpture Committee. And prior to that, Mary was a writer and a curator with organizations such as the San Francisco Arts Commission, the Yerba Buena Center for the Art, the Cap Street Project and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Connecting from his office in New York, Mark Glimcher has served as president and CEO of Pace Gallery since 2011. He joined the gallery in 1985 as associate director and became president in 1993, around the same time that Pace began re representing Oldenburg and Van Bruggen as a collective. Under his leadership, the gallery has greatly expanded the scope of its artist representation, as well as its mission to support the work of the leading artists of the 20th and 21st centuries. Mark has opened galleries in London, Palo Alto, Hong Kong, Seoul, and Geneva over the last decade, spearheading Pace's geographic expansion while growing the gallery's audience across a global and intercultural art world. Here in New York City, Mark oversaw the design and construction of our beautiful new building at 540 West 25th Street in Chelsea, of which this exhibition occupies two entire floors. Um, and this was a special moment, not least because it marked the 60th anniversary of Pace Gallery. Mark has curated many exhibitions and numerous essays and worked especially closely with Oldenburg and Van Bruggen over the course of their final two decades of collaboration, which is why I'm particularly excited to have them in the conversation today. Finally, last but not least, kindly logging in from Berlin at this late hour is Kasper Koenig, who was only 23 years old when he curated a Klaus Oldenburg exhibition for the Moderna Musique in Stockholm. Kasper hardly needs any introduction, but suffice it to say that he's one of the most celebrated curators of his generation. He organized exhibitions and published books while living in New York and Nova Scotia in the 60s and 70s, during which time he developed a friendship with Oldenburg. In 1985, Koenig became professor of art and the public at the Dusseldorf Academy of Fine Arts, and shortly thereafter became professor at the Städelschule in Frankfurt, where he served as president of the Fine Arts College from 89 through the year 2000. During that same period, he was founding director of the Porticus, an exhibition hall in Frankfurt, and indeed over the last 30 years has organized some of the most important contemporary art exhibitions of our time, including the inaugural sculpture project in Münster, which he co-initiated and organized with Klaus Busmann in 1977, as well as Westkunst in the Messe Hallen in Cologne in 1981. Uh, between 2000 and 2012, he was director of the Museum Ludwig in Cologne, and in 2014 was curator for Manifesta 10 in St. Petersburg. And in 2017, he once again returned to the sculpture project in Münster as artistic director. And I think that's perhaps the perfect place to kind of time travel back to the 70s with you, Casper, to the first sculpture project, which is um, really one of the earliest moments in which Klaus and Kosha collaborated on public art. Um, and you knew Klaus very well already by that point, by 1977, when that took place. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that time, about Kosha as a curator and, and your memories of their relationship leading up to the sculpture project, as well as the work they did together for it. So, <clears throat> Um, I'm very happy that you uh, invited me to talk about the exhibition in honor of Kosha and Klaas. I owe a lot to Klaas because I was a kid and I had a job at the studio. So I was not curating his show in, in uh, Stockholm. I just helped him. And it was fantastic because he would 
can we do this and do that? And how do we make it so that shipping is going to low? And so he's, you know, a Swedish hero and he became friends with uh, Eivind Falström, another Swedish artist who was living in New York. And he he's kind of a, an introverted lone, loner in a sense. And it was like being an assistant to a poet or a kind of a scientist, a mad scientist, so to speak. And that was on 14th Street, a huge, huge studio. And I had to go and get fresh orange juice and a bottle of vodka. Uh, nothing should be consumed other than afternoon, but at noon, boom. So, <laughs> That was a very chaotic and extremely productive uh, time. He had one area for writing in typewriter, one for drawing, one for making maquettes, and he was sort of multitasking. And it was almost like some of the subject he dealt with, like Robinson Crusoe or whatever. So he reinvented the world as he knew it as a child. That's a quote which comes off quite often. And a very uh, cosmopolitan, introverted person. So basically thanks to him helping him i had a i had a chance to get a green card to stay in america i left because i i didn't i didn't go to the army and i objected to the army but i didn't want to fulfill that one and a half year in a balloony bin because i objected to the army so therefore i needed a green card to stay in america and thanks to class i had a chance via the moderna said to get a green card, and then I could just get jobs. So I'm self-educated. I never went to university. I went to new school, but as an amateur, I'm still an amateur. So it's very wonderful what you say, but it just happens to be that I was very lucky, very much to class. And in 77, the idea of a sculpture show came about because the city, which is super conservative, very Catholic, and it was completely destroyed at the end of the war in retaliation to Canterbury. So the British bombers bombed the hell out of it because the Germans started the psychological war towards England. This city had no function of war industry and so on. However, these bombs were making the city completely flat, the inner city, historical city, but the sewers were still intact. So they rebuilt it as it was. And later on was very proud to restructure the city, but it had economic reasons, but they made it out because they are so conservative and they were not fascists. They were fascists like everywhere in Germany. They were maybe not so wild fascists than others. However, class, I invited class because I knew him and most of the artists were American artists. Also, Boyce was invited. And he said, to make public art is ridiculous. It's ecological kitsch, you know, show it indoors. But then I said, why, why do we accept our invitation? He said, oh, I don't want to leave it to, to, to the Americans, to Carl Andre. No, he was respectful. But it was, there is another tradition. And class really came in and shortly after that, Kosher appeared. I had no idea. I mean, I knew they had an affair and they were very much in love with each other, but I didn't, I only now found out that they married in 77, but he was quite often in Münster and she happened to be quite often in Münster as well. So that's really interesting. I got to know her. She's pretty much my age in class is older. And then later on, I, always met her on and off. And also at times when she was ill and she went to hospital and so on, and class was taking care of her, we had kind of contact over the phone. I would send her flowers or postcards or whatever. So from all the their collaboration, the one I would like to talk about maybe at a later point is the sinking of kosher, which is an homage of class to her contribution as a kind of art historian, as a theoretician, as a critic, and a co-worker. And this was made for Hartford and couldn't finally, even though it was financed, it was rejected by the Republicans or whatever, when Reagan became president. 
because they didn't agree that public money should be spent for art. So this is interesting that later on, it went to a fantastic building of Mies van der Rohe from 1928 to Krefeld. And I've read it purely as an homage to Mies van der Rohe, who is probably one of the great architects of the century. He's a, he's a structuralist, he's an objective artist, but he's also a fantastic architect like Palladio or like one of the great architects in the world. So he's very, it, it still has a human scale and it's very beautiful. And he was forced to leave in 34 because he was offered a job as the chief architect of the Nazis. Goebbels asked him, Fritz Lang and others, do you want to have a job for the film industry, for the architecture and so on? And he thought about it and he said, I'll let you know two days and he left, right? So Chicago and his contribution to architecture, also to American architecture is very, very profound. That's and, I think that's a really important point is the, the relationship between architecture, site, environment, landscape, and the work. And that's one of the reasons why I also wanted Mary to, to hear your thoughts about the significance of Spoonbridge and Cherry, which is of course one of, you know, Klaus's most famous collaborations with Kosha, and yeah. also one of the ones that's most directly associated with a particular particular location and site. And maybe I can just pull up an image here for those who don't know it. Um, but of course it's located at the Walker Art Center in the Sculpture Garden. And I wonder, Mary, if you could say a little bit about the significance of this work for the Walker, for the city of Minneapolis, and, and also just to you. Well, it certainly is um, an iconic work. I, I obviously don't have the, um, colorful personal stories to tell that Casper does because I wasn't here when this piece was commissioned, but Martin Friedman, who was um, the longtime director at the Walker um, had invited Klaus and Kuja to um, create a work when uh, the sculpture garden was constructed and, and really invited them to think about creating this kind of central element. And it is and remains you know, 30, 40 years later with um, even after the 2017 renovation of the garden, it is still the, the sort of central focal point of this somewhat neoclassical sculpture garden. Um, you know, I think there was a, an expectation that there, there would be a water feature, um, you know, that it would sit in a, you know, that it, that it might function like a fountain. And, and I have to admit, and I am not the only person um, <laughs> I, I've learned that I saw images of this piece for quite a long time before I realized it was a fountain. You know, I knew it sat, you know, in this um, pond, but I didn't realize that it had its own, you know, that it was a fountain, which I think just adds a whole nother element to it. Um, and it has become not only a symbol of the walker um, and one of the most iconic works in our collection, but, um, but also a symbol for the city of Minneapolis. And I think that, um, it's really been embraced. And I think that speaks to um, how it, uh, I mean, it's monumental, but it's also um, quite playful. And I think that the way that it invites, you know, that it, to speak to that sort of relationship to architecture and landscape. And I think Klaus and Kuja actually have done, you know, made a huge contribution to the way we think about that, the way artists think about public art in that way. And what, you know, the relationship of these kinds of volumes and imagery to a public landscape. Um, and I think that, you know, in contrast, if you think about, you know, the eighties, I think many people start, you know, think about Tilted Arc as that sort of like, a, you know, moment of public art that changed the way people think about it. But I think in contrast, um, you know, to sort of, it's, you know, this is a work that's much more generous in the way it, it appeals to the public imagination and, and an idea about pleasure <laughs> um, as opposed to challenging audiences, um, you know, to sort of really adapt the site to the will of the artwork. It, I think it does the opposite. It sort of grounds the, the, the sculpture garden and sort of creates that focal point at the same time, sort of, it doesn't overpower. It allows for all the other sculptures that exist there, there's a lot of, um, you know, it is, it's a pleasure garden in many ways. And it's interesting that, that 
actually they talked about this work as a, particularly a symbol of their collaboration. And yeah. they sort of debated like, you know, who's the spoon and who's the cherry? It could right. be either. Yeah. Um, but I you know, Mark, you, you worked with them very closely and you saw them work on large scale projects together. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about the kind of nature of their exchange and their dynamic and how the two of them related to one another. Um, they were they were a perfect fit, the two of them. And their secret language, uh, it took a while to learn <laughs> and spend a lot of time with them. You know, it was, um, it was Kosha's sharp um, words, um, honing Kloss's sharp pencil. And uh, he, he, his pencil is amazing. You know, anybody who sees Kloss's drawings understands that um, the ability for an artist to evolve a thought with the motion of <laughs> you know, his pencil, yes, fantastic. <laughs> um, and you, you see that, um, but um, that pencil was sharpened greatly by uh, Kosha's uh, trying to expose and get to the heart of the um, idea, um, the images and those um, questions that uh, Kloss puts up um, as he transforms an object that we know, um, you know, for that to take its place as a monument, I think, you know, Kloss began a lot of these monuments as a thought experiment. You know, you think of all of his great drawings of, you know, the watches for times you know, for, for Grand Central Station and all these great thought experiments. And I think Kosha pushed those into reality, you know, which Kloss wanted to happen, but I, I don't think, you know, even he had the aud audacity to think that they were gonna take the play or their place as these great, as these great monuments. And um, that was the beauty of watching them together, Kloss lives in his little notebooks, you know? <laughs> what have you got, Casper? Yeah. And, and Kosha, like, not only said why it had to happen, but how it was going to happen and brought these things to us. I think that there's very, people don't realize that, you know, it's a, it's a shocking history of monumental modern sculpture from, you know, from Calder to Oldenburg van Bruggen um, that, that gave permission to a huge, you know, kind of approach um, for, for artists to go out and try and wrestle with the real world, uh, which, is a, which is a tall order. Um, but together they had this, this way that brought them out there into that, into that world. Um, Absolutely, and, and, and thank you for that, Mark. And I feel like the engagement with the world and with the conditions of a given place is not always something people associate directly with their work, yet it always was part of their ideation and their thinking. And Casper, I'm thinking back to, um, to this work, the, the giant garden hose, that, that was the result of, uh, that you worked on with, with them, that was the result of a competition and happened not long before Spoonbridge and Cherry. And it's not really anywhere near as well known, I think, as Spoonbridge and Cherry, at least not in this country, but has a lot in common with it. Um, it's a sort of fountain in a sense. And it's, you know, the coloration, the way it exists in relation to the landscape and the buildings around it. Um, and I wonder, Casper, if you could just say a little bit about this work and how it came to be. So <clears throat> it was an invited competition. And uh, I think there were five, five artists invited. And I had a say about the, let's say the, the level of, of quality 
of artists who could possibly handle such a kind of uh, competition. Mm -hmm. And one of the favorites definitely was Jean Tingley, who made this extraordinary fountain in Basel, uh, where um, a classicist theater was torn down after the war because the theater people wanted to have a modern uh, theater, modern stage, like all the German cities which were destroyed and they bought, build, had to build new operas and new theaters, but not for the sake of the building, the, the people of the theater wanted a new theater machine. So Tangli, he was a window dresser at the time, he was 18 or 19, he saved architectural renderings from this wonderful classicist building, which was thrown down. And later on, he made with these architectural uh, aspects of a building, a fountain which moved, very kind of erotic, funny, uh, <laughs> spraying, and people love it. And Klaas had spent some time and checked out these gardenings, which were kind of uh, hobby gardeners, um, and that had a social background in the 19th century. That was an idea which also was very supported by Kosher because he had a, she, she is Dutch and she is a kind of a social uh, person. And also it's interesting, she had a very antagonistic relationship for good reasons, like all Dutch have towards Germany. So Freiburg, is a very particular academic city and very connected to the Reformation. And she got into the history and then class got into the formal aspect. And the garden house was one of many ideas, but it evolved and it was so expensive, it couldn't be done. And then the, the man of the city planning, who was very interesting in music, and he loved class immediately. They got along very well. He found an engineer who was pensioned and went to university to study Chinese. This guy was really interesting. And he was one of the big executives of a steelwork in the Ruhr district. And he said, come on, we have now a contract to making pipes from, from Russia to Germany and Germany back. And these pipes have to go in deep frost and we have a new method where these pipes are without a seam, you see? Like, like a silk a stocking, a woman's stocking used to have a seam, which was an, a very uh, fantastic attribute of Malini Dietrich and so on. But this was seamless because it could not bust. And then they were able to make this and the workers of the steel factory made according to class's idea, a really a true rubber hose and put it under pressure. And this with the computer technology that were able to make it, it would have been impossible to pay for it if you had to pay for it. So the company, which was really doing very, very big business, right? It was like steel, like, you know, in the 70s, steel, steel, steel. That, that brings up so many interesting things, Casper, because it is, it's both the technological, pushing the technological boundaries, but also being very open to different kinds of knowledge and different kinds of techniques and experience and wanting to incorporate that into the process. And Mary it reminds me of when I was talking to you earlier about the nature of public art, and you were saying how all public art in some ways is collaborative. Um, I was just thinking if you want to maybe say a little bit more about that. Because of course, at this beginning, at this time, as, as Casper has alluded to, you know, Kosha was a little bit positioning herself in the background, even as she was collaborating with Klaus. And, and that was partly because of this uneasiness, I think, with the idea that, that all of a sudden, the two of them would be billed as, as co-creators when Kosha had much invested in her, in her work as an art historian, as an expert on Klaus and other artists as well. So in a way, I think it's like we've come a long way since then with that discomfort. And I wonder, Mary, if you have any thoughts about how the nature of public art and the nature of collaboration, and especially the collaboration between sort of artist couples or, or married couples has sort of changed over the years. Well, I think, uh, I would say Klaus and Kuja gave permission for some of that. I think we also have Christo and Jean-Claude, of course. Um, and then I think more recently, Ilya and Amelia Kabakov, 
who um, also work on large scale projects and have that kind of collaborative relationship. Um, I, you know, I think in that we, we focus a lot about on the individual artistic genius, right? That is, um, there's a discomfort, I think, especially in the market <laughs> with the nature of collaboration and, and how to auth like what co-authorship means. Um, and I think, but I also think it's worth noting that, you know, they're acknowledging co-authorship comes sort of at the end of, uh, or, well, it comes after the movement towards conceptual art where, you know, the intellectual aspect of art is, ha, has gained some, um, some value in the culture so that that kind of intellectual contribution that someone like Koja as a writer and a, and a thinker, um, you know, that that, that complements Klaus's own sort of imagination and playfulness and, um, and as Klaus said, or, or as Casper said, deviousness, um, which is, I, I think I like, I, I really like that word as a description. I mean, I was using the word subversive, but devious actually is more playful. I'm sorry? I'm, I'm myself, I'm not a champion of public art. Of public I'm, art. <laughs> yes, I'm a champion of art, yes. But there's a lot of mediocre art. And if there wouldn't be mediocre art, there wouldn't be great art, whatever. And it changes also, thank God. Sometimes our opinion changes and so on. However, the idea of public art as a kind of, uh, a kind of art is really questionable because you make compromise, more compromise, so that everybody goes along with it. And then the surroundings change completely and you don't know anymore what it's, what it's about. So when Klaus, did his first work in Münster. Michael Asher did a work which was not connected to a particular location, but he was a California guy who said, okay, we go outside the town with a caravan and then move back into the town, have altogether 32 different locations, different weeks. And people didn't even, they, they never talked about it. They never wrote about it. I wanted to, to just pull up this image of Klaus and Kosha's work for the sculpture project in 1977, which were these giant concrete pool balls that they created. And just as a contrast to Michael Asher, that, you know, who's an artist who basically doesn't create objects or things, but um, it's a very different approach to art making. And we could debate, you know, the merits of the challenges of public art. So we're blue in the face, but at the same time, there is the reality of these pool balls that are still there in Munster and they are beloved by the city and they become a kind of canvas because they're constantly covered in graffiti and then they wipe the graffiti off and then people put graffiti on again. But the space around the pool balls becomes a kind of shared collective gathering place. So I think, you know, it's interesting to think about that aspect of public see, as class, a way of bringing people together in space. And caution, spend some time in a pool hall and playing American pool, which means 16 balls, right? Black, red, and then 16 different colors. The, the idea Klaus had was to have 16 pool balls all over the city, right? right. And that would have been a nuisance because you can't, you can't push them away. And then he came up with a sea, the lake, which is a, the board for pool. And he had three, because three implies there are many of them. Two, it would be just plus minus. But at the same time, in a diagonal, there were two, a sculpture by Donald Judd, one outer ring and one inner ring, according to the sloping uh, area towards the lake. The lake is just water level. So this was very conceptual, but it's fucking big. And it's like a Magritte, you can see it like a Magritte, but it's very different. You have a, a baby there, you have a baby cart, you have old people grumbling and so on. And people were outraged because why do we spend money on this? And then later on, it became the symbol for the city and class wanted to, to say, this is not a sculpture anymore. I said, you have to give money back to the, to the city. They bought the city, bought a jug and, and uh, the Oldenburg, the judge was completely ignored for 20 years because people thought it had some kind of meaning for the technical 
university measuring whatever because it was it didn't say hey look I'm art but with the balls it's definitely even though it's been below the horizon it's very very strong and it's concrete it's not color and there's a lot of spray and Kosha she supported the rawness she liked she was very minimalist she was for me she was very Dutch you know the great Monument. She wrote about she wrote about Jude, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it, it's very minimal and it's very physical. The material, and this is interesting. When I worked for class, I was a big fan of his collection of popular objects, and then that was presented at Documenta. I was supposed to work for them. I didn't like the job which I was supposed to do because Seaman already choose the artist. And then I said, instead, I propose a mouse museum of Klaus Oldenburg yeah. as a separate entity. And I became the ex, the, the director yeah, of a mouse museum, which was a work of art. Yeah. And later on, I actually became a director of a museum. That's also thanks to Klaus, you see? I'm sorry, Hesper, <laughs> that I left the director of the mouse museum off your bike. <laughs> really, I should have mentioned that important position. And Kosha then revamped the whole story and added the, the ray gun wing and they showed it right. and she made a wonderful catalog together. She made a wonderful catalog of that yeah. book and that's a great example of her being this kind of expert because I just want to say, note that it's very interesting that the pool balls, you know, Kosha pushed for them not to be painted because of course, had they been painted, they wouldn't be able to be this sort of canvas for people's graffiti, the way they have become over the years. And I'm interested in that, that aspect of public art. And it's something that came up, Mary, when we were talking. But I remember that I made a remark to both of them that I didn't like the new coloring before it was a, a scotch uh, plate, right? Mm. The, play, uh, the Scotch. Um... Oh, you're talking about the tie, Casper. Okay. Yeah. Let's look at that then. Kosha had changed it to a kind of business tie, right? Right. Yeah. Here Which is. was much more. This is in Frankfurt, right? Frankfurt. Where you were, where you were at the Stadel at the time, the Stadel Schule. And, and so, I was not directly involved. I was very much pushing him to make a commission, but I, it's not the subject and all that that was between them. However, when it was finally installed, I was surprised that the coloring was different than I had seen it in the studio. In the studio, it was a, a, a scotch plate, right? A crisscross. Right. And it had very much an association to a, a, a instead of having shirt, instead of having trousers, the Scotsman have a shirt, right? So for me, it was much more a joke that you, that the tie goes up and it's like a kind of sexual stupid joke of the fifties. Somebody sees like Marilyn Monroe and then this dumb guy, the brick goes up, the shirt goes up. Obviously the choice to make it not plaid was in a way a more restrained decision, but the, the sort of sexual reference in this is not gone. I mean, the fact that it is very phallic, it is kind of upright, um, the tie itself as a kind of, you know, has all sorts of references that one could read in that way. And, and it's certainly true. And I mean, I would invite, you know, Mark and Mary to, to, to speak to this as well, but that pleasure and desire and enjoyment are very much a through line in the sculpture. I think that you'll find in a lot of uh, their work, um, and this isn't a hundred percent true, but there is always a relationship. You know, there is some negotiation going on in all the work. There's a negotiation between the tie and the collar. There's a negotiation between the spoon and the cherry. Um, there's another great tie and collar, the, the uh, yeah, but you tie would have, and collar. You would have a relationship between a fork and a knife, but not between a spoon and a, and a cherry. This is very interesting. The cherry is very kind of, um, it's, very, it's very beautiful, it's red, everybody recognizes it, and it's also very sexy. Very, very sexy. It's, 
And that, that cherry, <laughs> that cherry, you know, has a nail in it, a bent nail, you know, and that bent nail is the, you know, is the uh, stem. And I don't know if, if you can, um, you know, if you look at the maquette, you see this little uh, wooden ball with a nail in it. And all, you know, that they had to do was bend that nail a little and it became a cherry. Mm -hmm. And um, this is the, <clears throat> you know, this is, um, you can see on the maquette, I don't know if you have a picture of the maquette or not, but those, those small economical moves um, are the things that energize the work. But it's almost always, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a duet um, that's going on in almost every piece. Um, you know, in the, in the uh, drop bouquet, um, there is this long, you know, history of Kloss making these flowers, um, which is a little dance between a piece of clothesline and a cutout uh, piece of paper from a magazine. And the clothesline penetrates through the, cu the paper cutout. And to make the center of the poppy, all he had to do was fray that clothesline a little bit. And um, this is what the two of them were like together. You know, they just made a little move and the thing came to life and all the magic came. And they were pushing back and forth all the time. And um, that's what made it come to life. Well, and that's where that tension, that, that sort of like erotic tension comes from too, right? <laughs> that you have this, the cherry that so, I mean, I, I, we started at the beginning and we we're like, what is that? What does this mean for the city of Minneapolis? And I think, you know, yes, it's, um, it's hopeful, but it's also like precarious, right? That cherry is balanced there. It's also, I think, you know, back to the sort of deviousness is like, you know, it's very hopeful and, you know, cheery and yay, cherries, like symbol of Minneapolis. But then, you know, it's also spouting water off that stem, which is a pretty <laughs> erotic, like it's pretty subversive to have like the city symbol be this very erotic sculpture at the same time. That water, that water, runs down that stem. Well, there, some it of it runs, some cherry. of it coats the cherry, so it's all glistening, Dripping but the it shoots out too. Shoots out. Yeah, so it's, it's a pretty, I think it's that's what there. I was saying. Like, I didn't realize about that water element until I saw it in person. It yeah. was like, it gave me I, a whole different appreciation for that sculpture. My favorite work, I look now at all the books of class, is this broken uh, button. button in Philadelphia. It's lying on the ground, it's split, so it's clearly not a button which you could use and, and, and you, it's worthless. And it's, it's kind of white, creamy in the snow. I saw it in the snow, I saw it in the summer. And you can sit on it in the summer, it's warm, and the kids hang out there. And it's a button, very recognizable, but it has four holes and it has a lot of kind of symbolic meaning if you want to get into it. And Kosha was very, she could write about it for, you know, but the amazing thing is when you experience it, you know, you crawl under it, you go inside it, it's just a button, but it has a quality like a Noguchi or a Brancusi, because it's not true that there's just Calder and, and, and Brancusi you mentioned, or there are a number of really great works, you know, in Baroque times and previous and so on and so on. And this is interesting because it's worthless. You can't use it. Who, who, you can't even buy it on a, in Canal Street or so. Who wants to buy a button which is split? So this, I think, has also to do with the discussion between Kosha and class. So one says, I like this, and the other one says, for the sake of it, no, I don't like it. I like it the other way around. Sometimes it works, and they have also done some works which don't work, I think. And the, the problem is with public art that they might still be around in 100 years for whatever reason, or people will understand it and then adopt the situation so people will understand it and like it. It 
can also become a symbol for whatever. But in general, I'm not propagating public art because in New York, there's no interest in public art. I've never seen any. I just have to take issue though a little bit with the idea that public art, I mean, I, I, I will not disagree that there is very little good public art, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I also <laughs> think that you make your own, you know, you work against your point because when you talk about like what's great about the button is that it's useless and people don't want to fund public art because it doesn't, you know, house office workers or provide housing or get us from point A to point B. But in reality, the fact that it is useless in that sense is exactly what makes it so powerful in certain cases when it's done well and right, that it, it can become a place for a collective imagination. Yeah, like for instance, and Tom that's Austin, hugely Tom important Austin. to our society, yeah, right? Tom Austin, he makes public sculpture with a communist idea behind it, a popular communist idea, mm -hmm. an idealist uh, social kind of uh, situation, which is very kids like it and old people like myself like it. So it's not, I don't want to generalize it. Yeah. But wouldn't it be true to say kids also like Oldenburg and Van Bruggen sculptures? Yeah. I mean, isn't that one of the primary ways many of us, certainly I, have experienced them? is as a child and the sense of wonder you have, you don't need to understand them yeah. to get from right. I'm. I, I hope I will see, I will go to Las Vegas to see that torchlight because I like the Las Vegas. It's like learning from Las Vegas. That was a key book, you know, in the early 70s. Venturi. Yeah. All art students. And Denise Scott Brown. Yeah. So. <laughs> Right. That I like. I like Las Vegas, the idea of what Las Vegas on oh, money and you lose it. There's the collaboration for you. Yeah. That I like the idea of the torchlight and not, not it's not where the strip is, it's just somewhere where people live, right? And then the university notion the torchlight at night during the day. This is their, their pro an early project there from the 80s in, in Las Vegas, which is a giant flashlight. But I would also just like to, to point out that in this era of pandemic, public art is of course the only kind of art that many people have been able to experience. Um, and Mary, you were talking about how the, the sculpt, sculpture garden in a sense has become something of a, of a space of respite and escape for people. And I don't know if you wanna say anything about that, but. Um, you see the, 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 the book and I museum, that's public art, it's fantastic. That's public art. Architecture and public art are very, you have similar criteria. Or they have completely different criteria depending on how you look at it. But, but sure, I mean, they're both highly collaborative. That's for sure. And we wouldn't dismiss all architecture because it's collaborative, but it has to be by nature. And maybe that is one of the things that public art and architecture do have in common. And one of the reasons why Klaus, um, Kosha and Klaus collaborated with, with architects, principally Frank Gehry um, on a number of projects. And so your reference to postmodern architecture is, is of course very relevant because that's informed their practice in a lot of ways. And right now, for the last four years, very involved in a project of Nicole Eisenman she did in Münster. It's a sketch of a home, and there are big persons lying on the ground, three of them in, in, in bronze and three of them in plaster. And there's a small kind of reflecting pool. It's very classical. The figures are almost Mayol, Degas, like of 19th century sculpture. And they, their sex is not clear. It's more women than men, but it's, and it's right placed next, a very, very beautiful area. It's placed at a little hill, which was a dating place for gays. And there was an anti-gay law till 63 or so in West Germany. And in East Germany, it was more liberal. And it's a law from the time of the emperor. So during the Nazi time, it was really prohibited, but after the war, it was also, for instance, my mother wouldn't be able to say that her, I don't know, one of her nephews or so was gay. She wouldn't find even the word to say it. So uh, this is, and then it was vandalized and then it was repaired and was vandalized again. And it took now four years to do it. 
again, and they raise money, public money. Um, and still the art world is very divided. They say it's moralism and so on and so on, but it's not. It's, I said, the, the site is too beautiful. You don't need art there. But now it becomes a real momentum and it is being carried by a civil libertarian group of people. Some academics, some students, some sort of no. politics. So public art is constantly, obviously, doing its job of making us all negotiate and renegotiate our, our places with each other. Um, it's, never, it's never that comfortable. There's always some kind of, uh, there are moments when it's comfortable and then there are moments when it becomes a, a conflict. Oliver, I wanted to go back one second to the just, the, the idea of collaboration. And I know we're, we're spending a lot of time focusing on public art because it was so central to uh, Kosha and Foss's collaboration, but someone brought up uh, uh, um, about the marketplace and about um, what it means to be a collaborator. And I, I was very fortunate to spend so much time with uh, the two of them and time with Martia. And to watch that evolution of their relationship. And um, I would say that you cannot underestimate the um, aggression of the marketplace against Kosha and against what they wanted as a collaboration. Uh, make no mistake, you know, Kloss was always a great supporter of their co-authorship. Kosha kept that co-authorship off because the art world would absolutely not accept it. Our art market would not accept it. It was made so clear by everybody. If Kosha's name was gonna be on it, it was gonna be less valuable. Okay, that was not spoken in hushed tones or secretly in a back room. That was out front. That was museum directors. That was curators. That was major collectors. You put Kosha's name on there, I'm not buying it. That, that is where everyone's mind was. You're and, right. And, yeah, yeah. And, but and, he hasn't heard. changed that much either, Mark. No, but listen, but it is, it's, it, it has not changed that much. You're absolutely it has right. Changed a lot, because when we invited in 77, all of the people we invited were men, no women. And I've talked about it many times and said, at that time, there were no women because we assumed that sculpture was a male occupation. 100%, yeah. There were no, but then 10 years later, and another 10 years, we have done it five times. And I was sort of attacked by a local journalist on the press conference. And I said, even though we said this time there would be more women than there are men, but he said, no, there are three people who collaborate together. Um, this Danish, uh, Norwegian team and so on, so on. And then I said, okay, but if you, if you count the the gay males, we have more females than we have. And thanks God, it was a local journalist and it's a kind of humor from where I come from, very old fashioned. If this is, would have been in Berlin, I would have been killed, right? I think, I think it's great that we've come to this finally at the end because of course the legacy of sexism in the art world yeah. has everything to do with yes. what it is that- yeah. I'm part of it, but I'm learning. Valued. Yeah. Yeah, but and, and also, yeah, and also that, yeah, that idea that Mary alluded to that it's some kind of solitary genius and that the mythology that makes an artist great um, it, is that this is a person struggling alone. And um, as, as long as, you know, if it were to be another, there could not be that level of greatness. Now, the generation that is in coming now, 
doesn't know anything about that. That doesn't make any sense to them that greatness is the product of, so, of solitariness. Um, that, you know, the idea that something can be, you know, accelerated and can be greater because there is collaboration is completely native and natural to um, a generation that's not gonna recognize you know, any of this um, in a very, <laughs> very short period of time. But Kosha certainly had to cope with this transition. And sadly, she did not get to see a point of time when a Oldenburg Van Bruggen can be seen as something greater than an Oldenburg. Um, but I can feel it down there in the gallery right now. And you know, when I, when I bring my kids and my kids, I'm talking about 28 and 30 year olds, as well as my little kids, when I bring them in, you know, they are so enthusiastic about the existence of that collaboration and that these things were born from it and, you know, outraged that Kosha had to hide her authorship for so many years. No, uh, she didn't have to hide but, it. Plus was very, very proud of that kind of I know, but I mean, she hit it, she hit it because of the market. Klaus was so happy for her, but she I think Klaus was the was one who was always market. saying, like, I better not put my name on it. You know, I better yeah, not. He with Dick Bellamy at the Green Club. Then he made a very smart move and he showed with Sidney Jennings and not Leo Castelli. He was not into, into. And he was a great, he is such a great collaborator, Klaus. Obviously look at the happenings. That was all about collaboration. That was all about, you know, multiple authorship. Uh, you know, he's one, he's one of the- only had so much control over that reception of the work and how yeah, the collaboration was perceived. I think yeah. to say that Klaus was and is, you know, will acknowledge the value of that collaboration and the fullness of the co-authorship is not to say that the rest of the world was so willing to. Yeah, they were not. Mary, it's very important that you brought this issue up. And I'm just saying that I was as biased as many people of my generation. Mm -hmm. And I remember I talked to two or three sculpt women, but they were skeptical because they also thought there was a man's career business. So it's, it's a double bind situation and I've learned from it. And it's very important to address that and not generalize as if it's a market or so and so on. It's part of our whole upbringing. You see the whole issue of what's going on now in Minneapolis. It's so fucking tragic because this has been going on for 250 years. And it kind of re-nationalizing you see in Germany, in Poland, in Hungary, it's very creepy. Yeah. Well, so I think we're, we're out of time. Oh no. It might be a, a good point in which to conclude our conversation, but I would just say that um, thank you so much everyone for really engaging substantively in this and debating. I mean, as you say, Casper, Kosha was your generation. And I think she <laughs> thought that a lot of these things really very much in the way that you do and also evolved according to, you know, the changes in the culture that have happened over the years. So it's really interesting and valuable to have your perspective, to have yours, Mary, from a really different angle, a different place in time, a different generation. And I really appreciate all three of you um, getting so good. Good to salute to Kosha and Klaus. It's wonderful. Thank you, Mark. You know, also for you. It is, this is the beginning of a long, I think, process of reassessing what it means to be a, co a collective and to work together um, in the history of art in the 20th century and beyond. And as Mark says, like it's about looking to new, to genealogies that have been there all along, but haven't been understood to inform the kinds of practices that are happening today. So I thought this was really wonderful in connecting past and present in productive ways. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you for those Thanks stories, for Jasper. The load to motion and class. Yes. Kosha and Klaus. Thank you everyone for joining us. Okay. Have Bye -bye. a great day. Thanks.